Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Paul Thiessen, Ali Senjabi, AB Puppy, and brand new patrons, Gregory and David. Yay! Yay. Welcome. On this episode of DTNS, Scott Johnson talks about the importance of preserving video game history, not just the games themselves. Plus, Klarna turns a good news AI story into a bad news AI story. And sir, this is how you Wendy's. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, February 28th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You know, I've been joking around about how February 29th should not happen. It's it's against nature. Uh, but GPEG84 asked a good question. Whatever we do tomorrow doesn't count then, right? Because it's mm. a leap day. I'm going to remember that and blame them after I yeah. do it. It's kind of like the purge. It's mayhem day. It's the purge. All right, sweet. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, mayhem day comes in May. Oh, uh, right. right. Chaos day. Mm, chaos day. Yeah. Uh, well, then, let's start today's show with the quick hits. <laughs> Speaking of chaos, uh, Google CEO Sundar Pichai wrote a memo addressing Gemini's image generation controversy, where it sometimes made inaccurate historical images. Pichai wrote, I know some of its responses have offended our users and shown bias. To be clear, that's completely unacceptable, and we got it wrong. Last week, Google suspended image generation, creation rather, in Gemini. As for a fix, Pichai says, our teams have been working around the clock to address these issues. We're already seeing a substantial improvement on a wide range of prompts. So didn't really give a lot of information about what had happened, but looks like they're they're working on it. Talk about mayhem. Uh, analyst Ming-Chi Kuo says his analysis of supply chain data indicates that demand for the Apple Vision Pro is higher than Apple originally expected. Kuo says it looks like U.S. shipments will reach 200 to 250,000 units in 2024. Uh, says Apple originally only expected 150 to 200,000 units. He also estimates the current return rate is just 1%. So... All those early return things, those were just people making videos and then bringing it back. Uh, Vision Pro shipping times have also improved to three to five days. Quo says he thinks this is all a combination of relatively high U.S. demand and plans to roll out sales to other countries in the coming months. The president of the United States signed an executive order limiting, not banning, but limiting the bulk sale of geolocation, genomic, financial, biometric, health, and other personally identifying information of U.S. citizens to companies in Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Cuba, and Venezuela. The order says the bulk sale of such data poses a national security risk. Companies' ability to sell data as part of cloud service contracts, investment agreements, and employment agreements will likely be affected as well. Nintendo is suing someone. Shocker. Uh, this time, they're suing the developers of emulator Yuzu, Y-U-Z-U, in U.S. federal court, alleging Yuzu violates the anti-circumvention and anti-trafficking provisions of the good old Digital Millennium Copyright Act. The DMCA strikes again. Nintendo also accuses Yuzu of copyright infringement, arguing that Yuzu is primarily designed to circumvent several layers of Nintendo Switch encryption so that its users can play copyrighted Nintendo games. So if that wasn't clear, they're suing them for circumvention, which could be a fair use, but under the DMCA, if you're doing it to get around copyright, you're violating the law and direct infringement, which is like you're actually encouraging people to do this. Nintendo wants Yuzu to lose its domain names, URLs, chat rooms, and social media presence. Uh, give yuzu-emu.org to Nintendo and seize and destroy Yuzu hard drives to help wipe out the emulator and, of course, money damages as well. Because why not? Oh, man. <laughs> Nintendo. Okay. Yeah. Not playing. Not time. happy with Yuzu. Okay. <laughs> the chairman of the EU's Committee on Employment and Social Affairs accused Amazon of blocking investigation into breaches of Amazon employees' rights and requested that the European Parliament revoke passes for Amazon's 14 lobbyists. The passes have now been revoked. He said Amazon constantly said it was unavailable to appear at hearings or take visits from committee members. 
Amazon said it declined to participate because the sessions were clearly one-sided and not designed to encourage constructive debate. It also said it didn't host committee members at its facility because the requested date was shortly before Christmas during peak season. At Christmas? Oh, it's with humbug. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. That's a look at the news. All right. If you're not familiar with Swedish fintech firm Klarna, it provides things like payment processing services for the e-commerce industry, managing store claims, customer payments, buy now, pay later provider. You have likely used Klarna if you do a lot of online shopping um, at some point. Now, Klarna, back in 2022, laid off around 700 people. You know, it was tough times. Uh, made some news. A, a small amount of its uh, of its of its whole employee base, but still a, a, a relatively large amount of folks. This year, it's expected to go public. The reason we're talking about Klarna now and talking about those numbers is because Klarna now says its AI assistant does equivalent work of around 700 people. Oh, geez. Cl- <laughs> Klarna partnered with OpenAI uh, last year, 2023, to offer ChatGPT technology as a plug-in for shopping. Last month, Klarna took that powered virtual assistant global, using it you know, across the board, now says after that month is up, the bot handles customer communications well, makes shoppers happier, uh, drives better financial results, uh, things seem to be wrapped up quicker. You're getting fewer uh, repeat questions about, you know, the same issue. Klarna also says the chatbot now handles two-thirds of all customer service chats, which amounts to around 2.3 million conversations in in a month. And some estimates show it improving Klarna's profits by $40 million in 2024. Now, as a company who wants to go public, uh, you know, uh, the bottom line makes a lot of sense. But boy, that 700 number stings a bit. I just, uh, just uh, this is an estimate. It's not, it's not something that had to be 700. I'm not advocating massaging numbers, but when you have a range to choose from, don't choose the range that's going to make people immediately jump to the conclusion that you've replaced people with the bot. The 700 people they laid off in 2022 were not part of the customer service because the customer service part of this is all farmed out to independent companies. Uh, I'm not saying it's great that they laid off 700 people, but it had nothing to do with this. It was two years ago, first of all, and they uh, they point out, and this is a little bit confusing, uh, a little bit of obfuscation on their point part, but they're like, we farm out our customer service to multiple companies that are made up of 65,000 people. It's like, yeah, but not all 65,000 are working on your account. Still, the point is, these 700 people that were laid off in 2022 were not the mythical 700 people that they say this new chat bot has does replaced. the equivalent of yeah. work of. So just make it 600 yeah. or 800 or something. It's, you're it still going to get people having this conversation, but yeah. when you make it the exact number, of course people are going to jump to the conclusion that, Oh, so you replaced the people, which yeah. they did not. It's a little bit like, you know, but way back in the day when Apple canceled the Lisa and somebody named Lisa also got laid off that week, it, it's just hard not to, our brains do this. We look for patterns. We look for stuff that looks like it fits. And this looks like it fits. Even if it doesn't fit at all, you said 700. Two years ago, you laid off 700 people. The math and the average person who's already if a little irritated with fit, stuff. You must acquit. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I guess it's just a matter of, you know, you got to think critically about this. That's on us. But I still think that's a very unfortunate thing to report. It's kind of on them. They should have said, "It's." Yeah. I like percentage, like Sarah said, do a percentage or something. Yeah, like that. do a percentage. I mean, that, you know, that sort of like unfortunate PR thing aside, what I think this does show is a company like Klarna uh, is going to benefit a lot from, uh, from, from chatbot assistance, AI assistance, you know, language model assistance going forward. Uh, other companies will too, but you know we talk all the time about like, well, but like which companies are really going to benefit from this? Sounds like Klarna is a great example of this. So you know, so much customer service kind of back and forth about probably for the most part fairly basic questions. You know about mm-hmm. like where's my order or you know you know you know 
I, I didn't get the discount that I thought I was getting, you know, that kind of stuff. That, that makes sense. It does. There, yeah. there are going to be industries where this does make sense and, and humans aren't needed as much. Well, yeah. and here's the other thing that's interesting because you have to keep in mind there's an IPO coming. So they're going to, they want to make their story sound as good as possible to potential investors, which is why they wanted to say, hey, we're doing the work of 700 people here because it shows how efficient their operation is. Right. But what they actually said was this chatbot has the same customer satisfaction ratings as human agents. Not better, not worse. Uh, it doesn't say how good the customer service of Klarna was before. <laughs> so, you know, it could be horrible customer service and the chatbot is just able to do also horrible customer service. <laughs> we don't right. really know. Yeah. <laughs> but not worse, Tom. Not, but worse. not worse. So not that's worse. important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't have sick days. That's the difference. Now, the, ro the robots you know, don't. Yeah, yeah. something to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so Clarda took what should have been a good news story, which is like, oh, we were able to provide better customer service to people, uh, even if it isn't exactly better. Uh, they could have said that. Uh, and they turned it into a bad news story by picking a wrong number. They should look at what Wendy's does. Wendy's said Tuesday that its new digital menu boards would give it more flexibility to change the display of featured items based on demand. That was almost entirely reported, and they never said this, but they implied it. So it was reported as Wendy's will implement surge pricing. Raise your hand if you saw that headline out there in the world, because it was everywhere. Local news stations were doing it. National news stations were doing it. Uh, it was all over the place. They never said surge pricing. So they came back to Reuters on Wednesday and said those reports were misconstrued. Hmm. Our intention is that we, quote, would not raise prices when our customers are visiting us most. So directly disputing surge pricing. We are not going to raise prices when our customers are visiting us most. Instead, we're going to offer discounts to customers, quote, particularly in the slower times of day. <laughs> so it's not that we're making it more expensive when we have a lot of people. We're making it less expensive when there aren't a lot of people. Oh. So here's my, here's my question, because surge pricing was something that, I don't know, I guess I became most familiar with it uh, when I lived in San Francisco and took a lot of Ubers. Yeah, sure. Um, that makes you sense. You know, on a Friday night, it's like surge pricing, you know, you, yep. you, you know, deal with it or not. We need to encourage um, more drivers out here. So we raise right. the prices. Yeah. That's right. So, but that always, you know, if I was going from my house to, you know, said Taqueria, um, and I kind of knew it was going to be six bucks, seven bucks, and then it's like, oh, it's 12 bucks tonight. Mm. You know, that surge pricing to me. Does surge pricing go the other way? Like, can Wendy's say, uh, you know, th that hamburger that you want, we know it's 450, but maybe if you come at an off time, it's, <laughs> it's only 350. Yeah. Turns out the way numbers work, you can set them at any level you want. Now, <laughs> I'm going to play both sides of this argument because when I first saw the surge pricing story yesterday, I'm like, look, folks, surge pricing actually does save you money in other times because instead of having to have the same price all the time, you can afford to have a lower price in the less demand times and then raise the price and have a higher price when there's more demand. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you have, everybody has to pay a more expensive price. That's that's go look it up. That's the economics of doing dynamic pricing, right? You end up, everybody shares the burden, whether there's demand or not, if you only have one price all the time. So yeah. surge pricing sucks when you're in the surge, but it actually does, you know, vary things out. And it's better when you're not in the surge. What Wendy's did is not, they didn't change anything. They just redefined it and said, no, 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 we're not raising prices when it's busy. We're lowering prices when there's less demand. It's the same thing. It's just which price are you going to call the base that changes? And the price is the same. Yeah. They're well, saying yeah. we're not going to have the same price all the time. Uh, but it goes down better to say, no, we're lowering the price than it does to have people say you're raising the price. And it worked because every story today says Wendy's backs off from surge pricing. And dummies. everybody's like, yeah, that'll teach him. Bunch of dummies that we bought into that. Look, here's the thing. This little this little fluctuating short term inflation idea, I kind of hate no matter what. I just hate it. I think it's weird. I think it's manipulative. And you I don't want like your it. burger to be four fifty. 
I want if it to 450, be 450. Stay that way. I'd like it lower than 450. But if it's gonna be that, then <laughs> yeah. great. Stick with it or whatever, because they kind of can do whatever they want. But this is how I felt when Prime did their whole for an extra three bucks, you'll get no ads, and they did the same kind of talk back. It was the half a glass half full, half empty thing, where they were like, "Well, uh, we're not raising prices on Prime. We're just inserting a few commercials." In there, it's the same price. We're not changing it. But if you don't even like those extra commercials, it's only two ninety nine, and 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 we're not raising the price, but we're raising the price. That's what you're doing. And so to me, yeah. this kind of like fiddling around, I hate it. I just hate it. I mean, yeah. so, this, this is so. They want you to think they're in damage control, and you forced them to do discounts, but they haven't changed anything. No, no, don't like it. I just, I, I don't know how different this is than any store being like, hey, these t-shirts are on sale. You know, yeah, they're trying to move not. some merch. I mean, yeah. you know, so, you know, okay. Especially <laughs> now the when price you... is lower and we might get more interest because of that. I mean, that's Clinton, what Clinton, Wendy's is doing. Clinton in our YouTube channel was just saying grocery stores do this all the time. The week mm. before the sale, they raise the price because grocery stores change your prices all the time. Unless you're really paying attention, you don't notice this. The prices go all over the place because they're trying to move stock. Uh, again, I say this all the time. Prices are not based on the cost of the good. Prices are based on how much will people pay for it as long as it's above the cost of the good. Yeah. This idea that like, oh, you should take the cost of the good and just add a little. That's not how pricing works. No. And Clinton was pointing out they do they do exactly that. You raise the price a week before a sale and then you make it buy one, get one free or, you, you know, or you make it 20 percent off and you're bringing it back down to the same price it was a week ago. Yeah, they did this with video games. Everyone always wondered why gaming uh, is so resistant to inflation. We've had $45, $49 triple-A titles for 30 years, and it really is a little weird that it's never gone up. And people say, why is that? What's the deal? It's us. We don't want to pay more than that. Now we it's finally a psychological are. game. Exactly. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It absolutely is all in our heads. And now they're 59, they're 69. We're just now starting to try to pry yeah. more money out of people. But it's it is us who either decides we can bear you know the, whether we are the market can we bear it or can we not bear it Amish Overlord nailed it he's like it's like happy hour pricing this is yeah, Wendy, Wendy's Wendy's should call it Wendy's happy hour like oh, my gosh, oh that's, that's, that's exactly yeah. what it is yeah. Yeah. that's exactly what it is the only difference is in old oh, without technology happy hour has to be at the same time every day now Wendy's can track demand and be like mm -hmm. ah happy hour is happening right now you you know it could happen at any time nailed mm. it. I will say uh, before we move on that um, I have never been able to say no to a buy one, get one free. <laughs> Even if I just wanted the one, yeah. I have to have both. Yeah, you know, I'm a sucker for that Psychological, again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing a special uh, buy one episode of DTNS on Patreon. Get 19 episodes free. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Just one price per month. Yeah. And we do this one. because uh, yeah. we, we because love y'all so much. Because we exactly. love you. That's yeah. right. The happy hour is on. <laughs> uh, you know what? If you want a recap of the week's tech headlines with insights into how technology affects and disaffects communities of color, you must subscribe to The Tech John. Uh, Rob Dunwood, Stephanie Humphrey, and Terrence Gaines do a great job diving into the top tech stories of the week, not with an agenda, but not hiding their own point of view. Uh, and it's a point of view you don't always hear in mainstream media. New episodes land Tuesday afternoons. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Go visit techjawn.com. All right, we talked a little bit about video games, uh, so let's talk more about them. The Verge wrote a great story about the Video Game History Foundation, or VGHF, a charitable organization dedicated to preserving, celebrating, and teaching the history of video games. Now, unlike other game preservation groups, because there are others, the VGHF is more concerned about the associated material surrounding video games, gaming magazines, trade publications, marketing material, concept art. The foundation has 8,000 magazines across 200 publications, it's working to make available online for anybody who's interested. Hurdles, though, because there are, include publishers who are a little wary of copyright violations and the ephemeral nature of the material, which is often thrown away. Now, Scott, uh, as a game preservationist, if I can mm, call you that, sure, <laughs> you're excited about what the VGHF is doing here. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about you know what's good, what's bad, and and what m might be difficult uh, for for the foundation going forward. Well, it's interesting because the culture of gaming 
is the one thing that seems to just sort of exist in its current day and pass us by and we don't think much about it. The games themselves, we get all up in, in arms about preserving, like make sure we've got plenty of copies of the original Super Mario Brothers for the Nintendo Entertainment System. And, and let's make sure we don't lose digital copies of stuff that were on digital stores that have now shut down. Um, these are all worthy things, but a lot of that's already kind of being done. It's being done whether it's being done officially or not, but it's being done. These guys swoop in and say, all right, that's great and all, but let's look at this industry, which combined the music television and tele and film industries combined do not equal how much revenue the video game industry does on an annual basis mm -hmm. and you might think well that should also extend to things like coverage of it and documentaries about it and uh archival information about it and the answer is or the truth is it's not even close so for example i mentioned that only four percent of books and two percent of documentaries have anything to do with gaming the rest of that is film, and this is just film and television documentaries as opposed to game documentaries. Um, and there's a big disparity. A lot of people ask, well, why this disparity? Why don't we have the same preservationist sort of ideals or even just historical observation of the gaming industry as we do other entertainment industries? And I think the answer is, is a simple one. It's still relatively new. Yeah. You know, we're talking 30 years, a little more than that, of, of, uh, of real content where you can you can say that's an industry and these other things go back way further than that and they also are a little bit more mainstream than that now gaming has gotten to be very mainstream uh to this point and so i think this is why now is the important part, part or time to do this and better late than never in my opinion uh because what interests me as a gamer um it's kind of all over the map i love games i love playing them i love getting the new, newest thing and playing my friends that's all good and important but what i really actually like is going back and saying, let's talk about the 16-bit era and why Nintendo did this and why Sega did that and why isn't Sega a platform provider today? Well, there's a million points of in information in between those two statements that are extremely interesting. And there's content out there, most of it YouTube, I have to admit, but a lot of content about uh, uh, you know history and the, the movers and the shakers and Shigeru Miyamoto and what his role was at Nintendo and when did he start and why is he so important and these kinds of things can be found but we don't give it the priority that we do somebody's film retrospective or a director who's who's finally retiring now let's go look at his 50 movies and why they were so impactful you're going to be lousy with that information and not so much the gaming side of it stuff gets thrown away uh, Sarah, you mentioned there's kind of an ephemeral nature to this content. At least that's our thinking around it. And I think that needs to change. And these guys are sort of all about that. I love this one story from the Verge uh, article. Um, and this whole thing, by the way, deals with the founder of this site or the founder of uh, this organization, the v VGHF, is actually uh, Frank Cavaldi. Cavaldi, I believe is how you said. He is the retired former head uh, editor, editor-in-chief of Electronic Gaming Monthly, a massively influential uh, magazine at the time. Uh, and people still refer to it all the time. But anyway, this story is pretty great. He says there was this game called Super Sushi Pinball. This is a game that does not prominently feature sushi <laughs> and never actually launched, he says. It was meant to be Sony's second game in the U.S. ever. It was intended for the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is well before the PlayStation. And this is during a time when such news would not have, you know, would not have melted the brains of console people because, again, Sony didn't have a, 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 a skin in the game. Um, and we it should was mention that this is what Ash Parrish wrote on Verge. You're just reading Ash's as well. I'm just reading some of this, yeah. yeah. And it says that uh, it was marketed in video game magazines over a year. Then this is his quote. This is a game that was last seen by anyone in 1990 at a trade show. Uh, says again, Frank, he says, it's just disappeared from the world. <laughs> I'd never heard of it. And I know a lot of this stuff. I've got some pretty deep trivia in retro gaming. And this is something I didn't even know existed until like today. Well, I think that if the if the game were in development today and just kind of just got scrapped, we would all know about it. Mm -hmm. You know, today, all of this is pretty well documented. You know, a lot of people care enough. Uh, you know, are following um, game releases. Um, but it, 
you describing this, Scott, it, 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 it was sort of like, okay, well, if I compared it to like, I don't know, Hollywood rumors. Well, right. the Hollywood industry has been around for a century <laughs> yeah, um, more. and more than that. Um, yeah. So maybe that maybe that has a lot to do years. with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that's I, just, absolutely I looked true. it up. Train, uh, train pulling into station or arrival train at station. The Lumiere film was 1895. Yeah. Uh, yeah so well know, over a century. When mm-hmm. was Space War, which is the equivalent in video games? 70 or no, 69? 62. 62. Yeah, yeah. Way in the 60s. So you've got, you know, 67 years film has had on it. And in my living memory, I, I remember debates being had about the preservation of film. You know, Scorsese and those guys were like, you know, these, these film canisters are not being properly taken care of. They're grading we need to do work to preserve them mm-hmm. it's normal when something's new nobody knows if it's going to be a long-lasting important part of our culture so nobody cares about it right right, right. Uh, but once it sticks around then you start getting preservation same thing happened with television back in the 60s the bbc just threw out the videotapes of doctor who because it was a kid show who you know but why do we need to keep it nobody knew it would become an important decades-long juggernaut of a franchise so they didn't bother preserving it uh, and video games is getting to that stage in its history. Now. I agree. There, there were t- there was a time in Hollywood where they threw away bloopers by default. Yeah, right. It was not a yeah. thing you'd hang on to. It's like, what's the you, point? You don't that, need those. You're not going to use them. Yeah, no. Yeah. And then now we miss all that. There's there's some, and it makes it really interesting because it's so rare. But yeah. in the game space, there is now plenty of of reasons, especially because we live in a modern day where our where digital archival is the easiest it's ever been. There's zero reason why they shouldn't get some priority. And I cannot applaud these guys enough. Uh, for doing this. Again, this is these guys over at gamehistory.org. Just go check it out. Uh, and you'll find all sorts of uh, amazing content already, kind of their mission statement, what they plan to do. Uh, people can contribute to it. And not only that, uh, it is going to all be public and they're going to just keep pumping it full of stuff. So yeah, this is this is great. To me, this is the wicked this is the Wikipediaification of gaming, or it could be the beginning yeah, of it's a library. Yeah. It's a library. Yep. I mean, it, we love I mean, libraries. <laughs> How are they <laughs> missing calling it the video game archives VGA? Oh, uh, that's it. Because then Nintendo, or no, who who owns VGA? Somebody VGA else. Is sue them. Is, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, somebody has that. Yeah. yeah, I don't know who that is. All right. Uh, while we get sued, let's check out the mail. <laughs> let's do it. This one comes from Lisa and John. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Lisa and John. I'm I'm happy. I just I don't know something weird happened She's with my breath up there. It's so nice. Sure. Uh, Lisa and John say uh, in the Scottish borders, we enjoy your well presented, informative, and balanced show very much. It is excellent in a nutshell. Winky face. We understand most of each topic, although occasionally we look at other each other baffled. We've learned lots over the years from DTNS. Hopefully, it'll keep us tech sa- savvy in our dotage. One thing we wondered, though, over a year ago, NFTs seemed to dominate tech news. DTNS explained and reported on them many times, we recall. Len Peralta said he had them on his website. Now nobody mentions them. Have they disappeared? Has anyone got any? And if so, what do they do with them? Have people lost money buying NFTs? I recall large sums of money being mentioned for a cartoon character. Appreciated NFTs may not count as news now. We were just curious. Uh, yeah, first of all, lovely uh, to hear from you, Lisa and John, below the Alden Hills. Uh, thank you so much uh, for writing in. This is a, a, a wonderfully phrased email. I enjoyed this very much. NFTs are still around. They were getting most of the press because they were new. Uh, And sadly, a lot of the reporting around them focused on the get rich quick aspect versus the technology aspect. And the get rich quick aspect has busted. That's why you don't see people reporting on them as much. The technology aspect has not progressed on NFTs much since then, but they're still out there. There's still a lot of companies issuing them and there's a niche group of collectors still collecting them but they've they've become an actual subculture now instead of when they were like hey they they might make you a lot of money they they were more mainstream yeah, but, and, it, yeah and instead of just bar- barfing something up in in windows paint and saying here's my <laughs> nft that's what was right. happening is people were just shoveling it it was shovelware uh-huh. and it was getting really bad and and this is what happens with a bubble and they had a bubble the bubble popped and now it's settling into what it will be and it turns out there's Lots of legitimacy for what it actually is and where it's actually going, but it ain't what it, it ain't that weird bubble we had for a hot minute. That was yeah. crazy. It, I think it, I think speaking of bubbles, it'll bubble back up at some point 
once someone has figured out a use that is more substantive uh, for it. But yeah, it will, and it won't be the kind of bubble that pops. Hopefully, it'll be one that simmers. It'll be just yeah. chilling, <laughs> a like a delicious, bubble. like a yeah. delicious seafood pancake. On there the, you go on the grill. Yeah. Uh, regarding yesterday's show with Dr. Nikki, Venura commented on Patreon, fantastic show. Had no idea that the blue on birds, for example, were due to physical structures. Nature is amazing and scary. Uh, also, as an ex-academic, the paper mill issue is serious. I remember reviewing papers purely as an advancement thing. There is some really solid research out there, so hopefully folks don't worry too much. And that's regarding the extended discussion we had in Good Day Internet. Thank you, Venura, for the comments that's great indeed thank you thank you to everybody who writes us in feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your feedback if you have some thank you to scott johnson hmm. you're the best oh where can people that. find your latest because you're always doing new stuff I do have a lot of new stuff going on. Uh, real quick, Dr. Nikki's one of my favorite people in the world, and I so love good. what she's doing here. So uh, keep that up, uh, Dr. Nikki. I uh, I started a new show, and I haven't talked a lot about it publicly because we've just kind of been getting it off the ground, deciding what's going to be. Uh, started out very casually, and now it exists. It's called The Monday Show, not to be confused with The Morning Stream. It both have TMS uh, short names, which we did <laughs> not consider at the time. Uh, but we've since decided not to care. Uh, but anyway, it's myself and my daughter, <laughs> Carter Johnson, who is a artist and works in the games uh, world as well. She also is uh, working up at the university in the department that teaches games and game theory. And we have some really fun conversations, and I think people will really like it. So check out The Monday Show. It happens like it sounds every Monday over at frogpants.com slash Monday, and you can get that podcast wherever you get your shows. Now, we have a special deal today uh, for patrons. They pay for one show, this show, Daily Tech News Show, but we're going to give them another entire show absolutely free. Good Day Internet uh, continues momentarily. Downloads of the Threads app are now well ahead of those for X, but does that mean it's more popular? We will discuss. Stick around. We will. Uh, reminder, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS Family of Podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>